While it has never been a secret that the United Kingdom was not one single state, but a union of Great Britain encompassing England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the thought of an even more separated Scotland and England has crept its way into an increasing number of minds. But with all of this talk of splitting up, it leaves some wondering, why did Scotland and England ever unite to begin with? Going all the way back to the 16th century, England and Scotland had been two entirely different governments under different monarchs. And in the case of Scotland, uniquely controlled in part by the Highland clan system. Furthermore, for centuries, the neighboring states had been at odds with on and off warfare, with the Scottish Wars of Independence being well remembered by both sides. But when the Queen of England died airless in 1603, a past of diplomatic marriages and childbearing set England and Scotland on an entirely new trajectory. A century earlier, James IV of Scotland had been wed to Henry VII of England's daughter, Margaret Tudor, and it was determined that, in the case of no Tudor heir being produced, the children of this marriage would be next in line for the English throne. At the time of Queen Elizabeth I's death in 1603, James VI was on the throne over in Scotland, and he was the great-grandchild of Margaret Tudor, meaning that he was suddenly a possible candidate for a new crown. The matter was not entirely simple, though, as a few factors, such as his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, having been executed for treason, could technically strip him of his status as an heir. But nevertheless, as the eldest possible claimant, an experienced monarch with living sons, and a potential way for England to ensure Scotland would not make any further attempts to ally with France against them, James VI of Scotland became James I of England and Ireland. And while this seems to many to be the start of what would soon become Great Britain, many more don't realize that it was James himself who wanted to see the Union created. King James, who had left Scotland in the spring of 1603 with the promise of returning every few years, in fact, only ever returned in 1617 and never again. He governed his home country by pen, as many describe it, and most of the job was left to a privy council in Edinburgh with a royal commissioner serving as the monarch's representative at parliamentary meetings. With James already proclaiming himself to be the King of Great Britain, what would later become the Royal Mail Postal Service was established to assist the King in his joint governing duties between London and Edinburgh, and he made no secret of his wish for the nations to become fully united. By 1606, the early Union Jack was already in the works by the King's orders and efforts were made at Westminster to push forward with the real unification process. But neither side was eager to be tied to the other, and James's hopes were gradually stripped away. Even so, it is debated by historians as to whether King James can be blamed for what would come next. While he did have ambitions for an unwanted union, James was also a Scot and is believed to have governed his homeland well even from afar. But many historians have begun to accuse the first British king of neglecting Scotland as the years went on, and possibly being the first domino to fall in the developing reaction. Whether this rings true or not, one undeniable fact is that James's son and successor, Charles I, was more English than Scottish, having left Scotland by the age of three, and this was readily apparent. Charles took the joint throne after his death in 1625 and wouldn't even visit Scotland for the first time until 1633. Six years later, the wars of the three kingdoms broke out throughout the British Isles over a combination of religious and governance disputes, and the result would be a catastrophe for James's prior wishes. His son and the current king was executed in 1649 as the English Parliament tore down the monarchy and declared themselves to be the Commonwealth of England, though this would only last until 1660. 
Charles II had taken the Scottish throne following his father's execution, and so when England moved to restore their own monarchy in 1660, Charles would reconnect the crowns as his grandfather had first done. And what came next would take the neighboring states just one step closer to truly uniting. As religious tensions between British Catholics and Protestants grew, the Jacobite movement that would later bring about the end of the Scottish clan system was birthed when James VII of Scotland, known as James II of England and Ireland, was ousted in England due to his Catholic faith, and for the same reason, his infant son would not be accepted as a viable heir. The English Parliament had chosen to instead grant the throne to his Protestant daughter, and if the Protestant Stuart line, the dynasty of these monarchs, were to end, the position would be given over to the German Protestant House of Hanover. In Scotland, James would remain king until 1689, the year after England had deposed him. But the Scottish Parliament, too, would opt to replace the monarch with his Protestant daughter Mary, after declaring that James had forfeited his throne. Nonetheless, Scotland was still not ready to be hand in hand with England in general, and the following decade was a rough one for the Scots, generally beginning with the catastrophe of the Glencoe Massacre. By 1619, in response to recent armed uprising by Jacobite supporters of the Catholic Stuarts, the new monarch, King William, husband of Mary, had demanded that all the clan chiefs swear allegiance to him and the crown. The chief of the Glencoe Macdonalds, who had been a staunch Jacobite and leader of one of the prominent Highland clans, had been waiting for a letter of approval from James to take the oath before the January 1st, 1692 deadline that had been given. That letter was not sent until mid-December, and a foggy chain of events afterward led to the chief of the Glencoe Macdonalds, Maclean, only leaving for Fort William to take his oath on December 30th. Upon his arrival, he was informed that no one there could take his oath, and he must instead go to Inverary, which he only reached on January 6th, five days past the deadline. Even so, Maclean's oath was taken, and he assumed that all was well. Unfortunately for him and his clan, the Scottish authorities had already decided that the Glencoe Macdonalds would be made an example of. In February of 1692, over 100 soldiers, led by Campbell of Glen Lyon, had been taken in as guests by the Glencoe Macdonalds for 12 days. On the 13th, though, 38 Macdonalds would be murdered in cold blood by their visitors. The day prior, Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon received the charge, Yao are hereby ordered to fall upon the rebels, the Macdonalds of Glencoe, and put all to the sword under 70. And so, in the early hours of the following day, blood was spilled throughout all of Glencoe. The chief would fall, in his case to gunfire, as did 37 of his clansmen and women. Many saw and still see this tragedy as being less about the Jacobite past of the Macdonalds and more as a part of the eventual successful efforts of the Crown to collapse the Highland clan system, especially as some evidence shows that a handful of Campbells, despite being clan rivals of the Macdonalds, had attempted to warn their fellow Highlanders of the massacre on the horizon came known that this was more than just the results of a clan feud, the Scottish Parliament and monarchy faced monumental backlash and a complete public relations disaster. And this wouldn't be the end of Scotland's troubles either. By 1695, efforts to establish a colony in Panama drains the nation of mass amounts of funds, which would eventually be all for nothing when the colony fell flat on its face. Speculations remain around whether the Crown sabotaged the endeavor to favor England, or if it was truly just a poor plan, but in whichever case, this is often seen as the final straw for Scotland's fight against a union. The Scottish Parliament would eventually succumb to English pressure in a tit-for-tat blackmail back and forth until 1707 that went from Scotland threatening to leave the Union of Crowns to Scotland signing the Acts of Union on May 1st, 1707. 
Great Britain was now officially a unified nation. So after all that, what was the real reason for the Acts of Union? Well, the answer is far from black and white. Though the 45 Jacobite Rebellion was still to come and the fight for Scottish independence would never end for some, through a combination of chance with the Union of the Crowns, a unification sentiment from people such as King James VI and other possible factors such as the crumbling of the Highland clan system and the financial damage done by the failed colonization plan, the Scottish Parliament would eventually decide that a union was in their best interest either their own or the nation's. For the English, securing Scottish friendship and loyalty meant that they no longer had to worry about a Scottish alliance with and threat from France, and eventually could bring an end to the Jacobite efforts to restore a Catholic dynasty to any throne. Whether the Acts of Union were signed with good intentions, or how good for either side the Union has been, is still hotly debated over 300 years later. But if history is to predict the future relationship between Scotland and England, it tells us one thing, nothing is predictable with these two.